senior blood testing, senior wellness. People won't pay for that. Are you kidding me? When you educate them about the importance and you share um, other cases with them about how you've uncovered early renal disease and liver disease, people want wellness. You just have to teach it. Teach it is all you have to do. And you don't have to sell it. You just have to teach it. So we've got to become educators of our profession. Now the thing is junior wellness testing. Um, Dr. Tockman, it's uh, Abaxis, uh, he's uh, I think now vice president or something. He's moved on up, but he's who actually called me to come here. Um, his training programs are about, you know, his, his motto is every pet gets tested every year, regardless of the age, you know, wellness testing. And so that's my hurdle right now. I went through all these. This is my newest one. They won't pay for that. <laughs> so, and you know, in your minds, and, and especially you guys that have been out of school for a long time, it's like, gosh, I just don't feel right doing that. I don't believe in it. And, but I didn't believe in all these other things either. <laughs> you know, so the rate of change is changing. So what's next? Well, it's human nature for us to resist it, right? So the things I was, I was experiencing are normal, and a lot of you guys would face the same thing. Clients won't pay for that. I don't believe in it. Clients are going to think I'm gouging them. And really, I'm just so busy, I don't have time to do all that. Those are the excuses that I made. And I've lived this. That's exactly why I know it's all true. So then the critics will show up, and they'll say three things. You know, that's too expensive. That would never go over around here in New Zealand. I, know it, I just know it wouldn't. And then when success happens, those critics will say, well, gosh, Doc, I was behind you all the way. I compared our two busiest clinics, the Proctorville Animal Clinic that, that Dr. Snyder and I are uh, presently managing and have been all the time, and then my, my partner's clinic on, in Ashland, Kentucky. Um, the demographic and the econ economy of these areas are 12 miles apart, so it's very similar. There's just not much difference in that. So here's what I did was I took our economic data from 2008 to 2012. And I averaged the numbers for all these different services by doing an income by treatment run on the computer. So this boarding value of $44,000 at Proctorville was a five-year average. Ashland's boarding, $108,000. So let's just jump down to patient visits. $16,000 per year average, $27,000 people patient visits. And patient visits, not somebody coming in to buy food. That means the dog came in for something. Okay, so dentistry, you know, we average a little bit more than they do. Hospitalization, um, you know, they're ahead of us a little bit, but proportionate to patient, patient visits, you know, we're, we're not too far behind. Lab and diagnostics, we're not too far behind there either. And I'll show you, I'll do a, uh, a comparison here in a minute on the next slide why this is so important. And um, vaccinations, heavily dependent on vaccinations where we're significantly less. So he's one low-cost vaccination clinic away from a big cut in his revenue if one would move in next door to him, right? So how do you buffer yourself against that? Well, you don't become so dependent on it. I don't, I mean, you know, we still have vaccine revenue. We still preach it. We still remind for it. It's still a part of wellness, right? I'm not saying don't do vaccines, but it just can't be the focus. Or if you look at his surgery numbers, where was that? You know, if a low-cost spay-neuter clinic moved in next door to him, he, you know, that would be a big difference. So let's just look at lab revenue since we're talking about wellness. And I, I, did, this for, I did this for lots of things, radiology, and I showed how much more revenue they could, pr they, could pr they could produce just by doing with their numbers, you know, if they did the same numbers per patient visit. So Proctorville generates $13.80 per patient from laboratory revenue. That's everything. You know, that's uh, blood draws and everything. Ashland Animal Clinic generates $10.10 per patient visit from laboratory revenue. So what I did was I took the difference, $3.70, we're doing more on every patient in lab revenue. Then I multiplied it by Ashland's patient visits. If they did three more dollars and 70 cents on each patient like we are, <coughs> They would generate $100,000 of revenue, and if you multiply that five years, half a million dollars, and if you put it in New Zealand dollars, that's about what it is. I'd like to have $600,000 in the next five years of 
high profit revenue. And um, purely because we've had to recommend wellness and, and more diagnostics and we're less dependent. Now he can make that shift, you know, if he needs to. You know, if, he, if, he's, if the vaccines are cut away from him, if the spays and neuters are cut away from him, he'll have more time on his hands and you'll make a natural transition progression over to wellness. And so it happened to us because we had to. And we liked it better. And it's just nice knowing you're the best sometimes. So what does wellness mean? Well, an ounce of prevention is worth more than a pound of cure. You've heard that. Or a kilogram. Is that what you say over here? <laughs> uh, but routine, well, anything, what does wellness mean to you? You know, it's more of a holistic approach to veterinary medicine. We want to be involved in everything to do with wellness of that pet. Uh, blood and urine testing. But all these things, behavior, dental care, you know, nutritional management, exercise and physical therapy is becoming a big part of in the United States about, uh, you know, recovering from surgeries. Vaccinations and parasite c control are mainstays. You know, we're not trying to get rid of that. We just can't make that be our, all, our, our whole wellness approach. So is sell a dirty word? Well, it's hard for veterinarians to sell anything, really. We're just not very good salespeople, especially if you're of my mindset. But if your motives are pure and you're always striving for win, 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 you're a pet advocate, then the sell is legitimized. Um, you won't be perceived like that. And we're always looking for the patient to win, the client and the practice to win. And then you start to build these long-term high trust relationships. That's that culture I'm talking about in the clientele. Your reputation increases, your staff satisfaction, their enthusiasm, they feel more involved with cases, their sense of value and sense of self-worth is increased. It's just a win-win for everybody. And one thing that I would like to say, and this is a quote that I, I can't claim it, but I've taken this quote from several different practice managers. We need to stop being doctors of veterinary medicine who manipulate our clients to buy services and purchases to support our practice and start being veterinary healthcare providers with an extremely valuable service that will benefit our patients and our clients. And as a result, then, our practice is supported. You see the difference? It's a mindset. For so long we get wrapped up in business and we're manipulating the client to, to buy the wellness or to buy the heartworm preventative or to buy the flea product. You know, we manipulate them through sales tactics to do that to meet our needs rather than if we step back and be a pet advocate and say, I'm a veterinary healthcare provider, I'm a professional and I have something that's really valuable to you and let me teach you why. You know, it's an attitude. Wellness is an attitude. And that's that wellness revolution that Joseph was talking about. <coughs> so when you do wellness testing, it opens up a can of worms. Is that a phrase you guys use over here, can of worms? Good. 28% of all wellness tested patients demonstrate at least one abnormal value that requires a recheck visit, further diagnostics, or immediate treatment. When you do wellness testing and you find something, part of the return on your investment is that there's always follow-up care. And I'll show you an example of that. At least 10% of all wellness tested patients are diagnosed with some type of cl subclinical disease. And that came out of a Vet Economics Journal article. But the scary thing about doing wellness is, is you gotta know what to do when you find something. Um, we're inside of a worm right now. Um, <laughs> but when you look for things, you find them. Now what? So more advanced testing, more follow-up visits, more treatments, more revenue, more satisfied clients. Um, you're a better doctor, better reputation, win, win, win. And when do you start? Honestly, puppy's 16-week last booster visit. My staff is trained to be drawing blood and recommending a pre-anesthetic profile. Does two things. First, we're imprinting on the mind of the client that that wellness blood test is important at an early age. So they'll always think it's valuable, right? Um, the next thing is, is I'm pretty much guaranteeing they're going to have that dog spayed or neutered at my hospital. And they're going to have it done within a month because I only honor blood values for about a month. So you're training, you know, your client as much as anything that it's important. What's my compliance rate with that? Probably 50%, but my overall pre-anesthetic blood work compliance rate is around 90% on 
on all patients that go under anesthesia. We've just made it a part of our culture, and we've taught people how important it was. And it doesn't happen overnight. This is a progression over years of training and teaching. But you're setting the stage for future testing in the client's mind that this is now the standard of care. You know, at Proctorville, they draw blood, and now they're probably going to other practices that don't do that, and they're wondering why. And eventually, clients come and ask, you know, and we send reminders. And so they come for a senior wellness visit, and, and uh, I've heard them say, well, I got a reminder for this uh, senior wellness visit, and I need to get some blood drawn. They, they're, they're coming back and teaching me what they need. You know, it's, uh, it, it cycles back. So Katie is this five-year-old, now spayed boxer. She wasn't spayed till later, but because on her pre-anesthetic blood draw on her last visit was at 17 weeks of age. And uh, her alkaline phosphatase was 1,088. Her ALT was 752. Red flag, we canceled her spay procedure. We went ahead and did a full chemistry and a PT and a PTT, and that was normal. She had an elevated GGTP. And so she's been down back in our practice many, many times, month after month after month, monitoring these liver values. So serial blood monitoring, we did serum bile acids. Um, we did a liver biopsy. We sent her up to the university to an internist and they diagnosed her with a congenital liver disease, probably nothing, nothing concrete. But the numerous follow-ups and lab work and the bonding of that dog with our practice, everybody knows who Katie is in our practice. All the nurses, all the, uh, I mean, the doctors, and um, because you know, she's been there so often. And, and about a month ago, she developed a little tumor on her lip and so, you know, we know that she's got liver disease. We checked her liver values. She's on Dinmarin and a special food. And uh, Dinmarin's a SAMI or SILMI. I don't know what you guys call things sometimes. But um, she's doing well. You know, her prognosis long-term wasn't good. But she's, she's now five. She's doing great. I did her annual vaccinations the other day. And, uh, but she's just one, you know, testimony that, gosh, you know, maybe pre-anesthetic blood work on a puppy is a good idea. We've got a client that loves us and a dog that, you know, everybody loves. And it's been a win-win-win situation for, for them. So the pre-anesthetic progression, this is just a challenging question on where are you, and I don't want answers, but you might be anywhere on this scale from we don't recommend it necessarily. We allow it, you know, optional pre-anesthetic blood work. We offer it and use a permission slip to accept it, or we offer it the option of accepting or declining it or um, we just require it for sick or senior patients, or we require it for everybody. These pet aging charts, and Abaxis has them, and that's in pounds, not kilos, but um, I used to have a, another version on the back of every exam room door for clients to see, because they love to know in human years how old their pet is. I don't know why it's such a big deal, but Buffy's 70 years old now, and golly, this chart's so cool because it's color-coded, and for these younger dogs, a basic chemistry panel might be all that's necessary. And as they get a little older, we'll do a little bit more, and then you get down to, you know, a little bit more, and then, you know, level four is, a, a, you know, a lot of analysis and a lot of diagnostic testing. And when a client sees that, that's published, not necessarily by you, in their mind, it's kind of industry standard. Wow, you know, Buffy's in this green area. This is the testing that they need. And so Abaxis has these brochures that has that in it that you can give the client and they take it home and mull over it and you know it, it's an educational piece and people I'm a you know a firm believer that people retain a whole lot more of what they see and what they hear than than just what they hear it's more important for them to see it than for you to just tell them about it so visual reminders and visual education is is key for a lot of this to happen um, but anyway eventually clients start coming to you requesting you know uh, rather than you having to sell it to them um, and, and, and really, I think a lot of this wellness thing is something that you have to tailor for your own practice. I've thought about trying to put together wellness plans and say, this is what you should do. You really need your language on it. You need your, your uh, personality needs to be on it. You, you know the culture of your practice and you know what your clients, but what I'm challenging you to do is go a little further than where you are now uh, with your recommendations. So the roadblocks to initiating wellness, I'm going to tell you that it's you, only because it was me. Uh, I was the roadblock. 